Hello, everybody. This is the Dax speaking, and I come to you today about a subject that has been causing lots of um, fuss. And specifically, one of my uh, YouTube buddies, Modias, has uh, issued a statement, a video statement, uh, where he uh, essentially um, is putting forward and advancing the notion that genetically modified organisms are somehow to be uh, doubted and uh, combated and resisted. So, since I am favorable to genetic modified organisms, I suppose it is my job to present uh, a case that is favorable to it and um, try to justify why I'm favorable to it. And I find that um, skepticism regarding the positive claim that they're not safe uh, needs to be uh, needs to be challenged, essentially. So I follow uh, lots of sites uh, of uh, skeptic skeptic uh, nature, like uh, one of my favorite, which has been helping me uh, gather information on the anti-vaccination movement and stuff like that. And all paranoid other paranoid uh, movements is a site called Science Based Medicine, which I highly recommend to you guys. Now, when I try to uh, gather information about uh, genetically modified organisms, the first thing I did was to was to was to put a query on, on Google saying something like Science Based Medicine, GMO, and there it is. So let me read it. So this is from a blog of Science Based Medicine, and it says like this. Much time, money, and ink is spent in our culture obsessing over what foods are good or bad for health. Oftentimes, such claims are out of proportion with, with available evidence, perhaps based on reasonable sounding theories, but not so much on convincing data. Here are a few examples of science based medicine bloggers addressing food and diet. I'm going to provide links so you guys just bear with me. An interesting subset of food claims relate to the safety of genetically modified organisms. GMO in the food chain, safety both for individuals and for ecosystems. I'd like to recommend science-based medicine readers to a blog called Biofortified, written by graduate students and scientists in plant genetics. The Biofortified bloggers explain hot topics and controversies in genetic engineering, attempting to cut through the wild propaganda in favor of calm science. The authors tend to be more pro-GMO than not, perhaps unsurprising since their careers are spent studying them, but they strike me as quite reasonable in their support. Here are a few posts I liked, and here are the posts, and I picked two of them. One is called Fears About GE Crops, the other is called Food Labels. There are more, I'm going to provide links so you can read it, because they, in turn they contain links to other articles, and you can, like, follow. So, first, first article called what scares you about GE foods in the debate over genetic engineering there are many emotions in place such as optimism anxiety compassion greed joy and fear one emotion seems to dominate the anti GE activists and that is fear fear of corporations fear of science and fear of the unknown are wielded as weapons to scare the public into rejecting the use of this technology for crop improvement one of the most recognizable terms used to instill fear is the label Frankenfood. Images crop up of a monster that's not supposed to exist, a mad science experiment gone wrong with parts taken from dead bodies, an abnormal brain lightning and the cackling of human hubris echoing in a castle. It lurks in your corn chips and the pumpkins you use to make your homemade pies. Once humble grains and vegetables wrested from the laws of nature will haunt your supermarket and terrorize your neighborhood. It sounds heinous, it sounds disgusting, it sounds sensationally inaccurate. In fact, one could write a whole book on how mythical this label is when it comes to describing genetic engineering. Actually, one has. There's a link. Splicing together DNA and inserting it into a plant to achieve a desired trait is nothing akin to reanimating a dead person during an, ele an electrical storm. Nevertheless, the word continues to be used merely because it conjures revealing images of human eyeball sandwiches and carnivorous killer tomatoes on the loose. And so the propaganda takes the place of rational discourse on this issue. If GE foods are to be feared like a slowly advanced zombie, how are you supposed to evaluate the risks and benefits? Gee, should I keep Frankenstein's monster around a little while and get to know him before alerting the townspeople? Shall we just follow Gaston and kill the beast before beauty can introduce you to him? In such mythical situations, we can easily see as outside observers that it is best to come down and go through the details. But the mythical situation is what they would probably rather have everyone think they're in. Besides mythical fears, there are legitimate concerns with GE crops. What about introducing allergens into food 
that weren't there before? Or how about whether the Bt protein introduced to kill insects will affect our health? Will the intellectual property issues turn the world into a few kingdom ruled by today's seed companies? Sadly again, these fears are trumped up as well. For example, we know that large protein molecules that are slow to digest can cause allergies. Some of the more potent aller allergic proteins are gigantic seed storage proteins, such as in the peanut. The only function of these molecules is to pack it in as many am amino acids as they can to store up the building blocks for the developing seed. Most proteins degrade in our digestive system pretty rapidly. But some of these larger ones stick around a while longer, enough time to, uh, for our immune systems to uh, come in contact with them and are fooled into thinking they are pathogens. The swelling, nausea and pain that follows is an allergic reaction. So are allergens secretly hiding in our corn chips? No, because in order to get approval for a GE crop, they have to go through several regulatory hurdles. One of these steps is to determine if a protein is an allergen. By finding out the size of the added protein, regulators can determine if the protein is large enough to be a potential allergen. If it is, the next step is to test samples of the protein with pinprick tests, or go for a full-blown digestion simulation. The risk of introdu introducing an allergen in this process is exceedingly low, probably lower than the risk of accidentally making crop allergenic through conventional breeding, where no such tests are required. Who knows what could be lurking in some wild tomato relative. Hold on, before you get the idea that I'm trying to make you afraid of conventional, conventional breeding, I want, you to, I want to know that the risks of unintended consequences, regardless of the method used, are very low. But you should know that no method, whether ancient or modern, is without risk. Fear, it seems, breeds in the absence of knowledge. By leaving our, out factual information and rational comparisons of risk, they can cultivate fear more than if they accurately described it. You should be scared of biotech foods because transferring a gene between species is risky. Well, not nearly as risky as generating new variations through mutagenesis, which we've been doing for a long time. That doesn't quite make you afraid enough to write to your congressperson about banning GE crops, does it? So I think there is a substantial amount of food that can be done through educating the public about the details of genetic engineering and explaining why a great many geneticists are not afraid of the changes brought about through genetic engineering. Indeed, many of the changes being made in newer experiments with GE crops involve adding things that you want in your food, like vitamins and antioxidants. So the patchwork frankenfood of secret poisons injected into your food is even farther from the truth than it was in the last decade. Instead of a monster, maybe there's a more fitting way to depict GE foods. Okay, maybe that's over the top too. There are a few things that scares me about GE food. Uninformed activists and an, infor and an uninformed public. The first is problematic in many ways. If you take the time to advocate for a particular issue, shouldn't it be necessary to know a lot about the issue in question? For instance, why would a book author make obviously wrong statements in an interview while purporting to be an expert on genetic engineering? Did they do not do their homework or do they believe cynically that they can convince an unwary audience with falsehoods? Both options are scary if you think about it. An uninformed public is also particularly troubling. Citizens are being asked to vote on laws concerning genetically engineered crops, and most do not know anything about them. When media coverage is either scant or ill-informed, what is left for you to influence your decision-making? Fear. This is where scientists need to step in and reach out to the public to help them understand these issues. Another thing that scares me about GE crops is, is what our lives might be like if we didn't pursue genetic engineering. I'm not talking about doomsday scenarios of a world without food or crackers made from people, but instead the very real and present risk of malnutrition, lack of resources to control pests, uncontrollable crop diseases, and more. Anyone got a non-GE solution to papaya ring spot virus? And finally, I'm afraid that our collective food awareness energy will be wasted on empty fears when they should be directed toward more real threats to our agriculture and health, infectious disease, animal health, environmental degradation. There are many constant and pressing dangers in our food supply. Two years ago, some spinach was, a taint, was tainted with E. coli. 
on a farm in the Salinas Valley, where there have been numerous E. coli outbreaks for the last decade. In the same time period, not one person has ever been confirmed to have gotten sick from eating a GE crop. Now that 205 people got sick and three died from eating contaminated spinach, public attention has focused more on this issue. But if the public focus was directed more at this demonstrated threat, could disasters such as this have been avoided? Now I'd like to turn it to you. What scares you about genetic engineering? Okay, so I don't think I've got the time to read another one. It's 11 minutes, so bye-bye and think about it.